in the first place, I think, um, why I was studying dentistry at all. Um, I was uh, really working with my hands always and making sculptures and drawings and these type of things. And uh, in the end, my brother was studying in the university and I was also in music. So I didn't know what to do in reality after my school. And then all of a sudden, my mother said to, you, to me, um, why are you not going to do dentistry? Because there's something in the university for the brains and something for your hands. And I thought, well, why not? So, uh, so I entered the dental school. And on one hand, that was really great. On the other hand, I was also a little bit uh, maybe too uh, fast with the handicraft. And I was a little bit uh, um, annoying myself. And then in the, f in the fourth year, there was a, a new professor appointed. And it was a professor in, uh, in periodontology. And we didn't know exactly what it was. And then he gave in 1968 his first lecture. And that was really different because in those days, professors had a tie, like me now, and a jacket and so on, and they were very dings distance between teachers and students, etc. But he came in like a hippie, with a uh, leather jacket, and uh, talking like a, an artist and so on. And he also had a lot of uh, friends in that area. And he uh, brought in the, his first lecture, and in his first lecture, he showed us uh, this slide. And he was talking about, um, what do you think that if you would have such a wound on your arm? Well, everybody said, well, I go to the doctor. And, uh, but if you have it in, in your gums, nobody goes to the doctor. And this is covered with all kinds of microorganisms and they may uh, come into your blood and may cause all kinds of damage. So, and that was so different approach to this mechanical, mechanical dentistry in which they were still uh, taught in, uh, in uh, three occlusal points and to Thomas Abwex techniques and so on. And uh, Leo Coppers called that, uh, um, it is, uh, what was it, playing gnatological games instead of science. Almost nothing was really evidence-based. So that was such a new thing that uh, I immediately afterwards uh, went to him and uh, said, well, uh, can I become st a student with you? And so first it was, of course, uh, um, just like a normal student. And then I got an appointment at the department. And the last two years I was with him in the department. And he was also a very uh, good teacher. So I did my first flap in 1969, uh, almost not knowing what, what I was doing. But he just, and that was, that was the area in which flaps were done from the second molar to the incisor and the other way around in that in upper and lower jaw. And, uh, so he did the first part, and then, uh, then he gave me the knife. So go on, go on. Yeah, good, 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 good. And since I'm not I'm really handy, it, was, uh, it went uh, quite nice. And, and later on, the background came, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, was a completely different world. And one of the reasons that I could stay is that I had still to go into the army. But in those days, the Dell School had two uh, places, full-time appointments, to keep people out of the army. And he wrote a letter that I was uh, understandable for the university. So he would like to have me in the department. And so I had to stay at least for five years in the Department of Periodontology. And in the end, it became uh, 40, 45 years. So that's why I came in. Of course, we had the Scandinavian schools in, in, in Oslo uh, 
and in Gothenburg, but also in, uh, in, in the UK. I think that the uh, um, Royal Dental, uh, which have been, uh, uh, we have con very good contacts with them, they were uh, quite uh, ahead of us. And so our, when, we, when we started the periodontal department, we had to make educational material. And we used uh, slides from the Royal Dental, which we got for free. And I must say that um, Jens Weerauk, um, when we visited him, he was uh, busy with making his uh, slide tape series. And that was amazing, because if I look back, most of that material is still valid. And he was making these stories and, and drawings and, uh, and his logical sections, etc., etc. It was, so it was, uh, it was great material what we could use in Amsterdam for, uh, for education of the students. I did my PhD in 1981, and that was on probing. And probing has been a topic of research in our department from right from the start, uh, I must say, almost up to today. The, uh, um, it started already in the period practice of uh, Leo Coppus, because he, uh, when, when he lectured uh, in the beginning, he showed us a slide of his research results, which, uh, which showed that if you have before initial therapy, and that is a study from 1964, not published, he looked at uh, probe, probing uh, pocket depths of pockets in those days, uh, four millimeter. And he said, what happened to this pocket of four millimeter? And then he showed that uh, one had become nine, and a few had become eight, and a few seven, etc. Of course, on average, the four became 3.2, but were a number of pockets which were deeper, and that was due to the dental conditions of the patient those days. So lots of calculus and lots of uh, um, overhanging restorations in making it impossible. So you remove the overhang and you probe deeper. You remove the calculus and you probe deeper. So when I did in the early 70s, my patients, we did not make a periodontal chart before treatment because it was a waste of time. So the patients which come nowadays in it's a totally different patient, patient population than we did. We have lots of dental hygienists, so, and the restorative business is better, so you can nowadays make proper periodontal charts before treatment. So, um, Leo Coppers was uh, appointed as professor, but he had not a PhD. And so he uh, said, well, I'm going to do to make my PhD still. And in 1971, he did, made his PhD on probing. And one of the aspects of that was that he said, well, maybe uh, we should develop force control probes. And they said, well, that's good. That may be a good uh, topic for you, he said to me. And uh, we had uh, a guy in the, in the dance school, Hans de Vries, and he was an engineer, and he uh, was able to make such a probe. And that's uh, how we uh, used the uh, air-controlled pressure probe. And uh, that, was, uh, that gave us a lot of information. And it is also uh, a little bit frustrating, because Pressure probes of force control probes are still not used in general. They are sometimes used in research. And um, what is the reason for it? I think that, uh, that the reason is that the, if you use a force control probe, you are not looking or knowing what you are doing. You press something 
in something. And that, and if you look, if I look to my old slides and sections, you can see that sometimes you are far uh, above the attachment level, and you are probing the pocket wall. And so, keeping contact with the root surface is essential for proper diagnosis. And that's something which is very difficult with pulse control probes. And another frustrating aspect of, uh, of uh, the probing issue is that we uh, are still use our manual probe and we are still not able to diagnose the proper attachment, the true attachment level. We talk about probing attachment levels. And uh, nowadays, I think that it is even more important that we should develop something which can really diagnose the proper attachment level. Because um, my ideas about how periodontal disease progresses has changed. I always said 20, 30 years ago that it is a slowly progressive disease. However, nowadays we have so many dental practitioners who make radiographs and our postgraduate students are always trying to retrieve any information about previous radiographs. Then you'll see that sometimes there, there's progression, a severe progression in one or two years and then the stable for another eight years. And um, the problem is that if you have, if you can diagnose in the acute situation the attachment level, then you may be able to get um, remineralization of the connective tissue completely. So, so for instance, um, when you have a, a juvenile periodontitis case, That's one of the seldom occasions when there may be an invasion of AA. When it is still invasive and you give antibiotics, you see complete heal. But how do you know that it is the active phase? Because sometimes you gave the antibiotics and it doesn't change. And I think, in the end, I got a kind of nose for patients in which the disease was active. And in those exceptional cases, I gave right away antibiotics. And sometimes you get 10 millimeter pockets completely away, complete bone reappearance re on the radiographs. And this is your only to do when you're able to really uh, diagnose the connective tissue attachment level. So our diagnosis with a periodontal probe is completely effect obsolete, but we have nothing better. So there's a uh, room for new research and hopefully I have the time to sh see people who come up with a technique in which we can do this because that will be of major help. I think that, uh, that uh, one of the reasons that I have never been away from ACTA is that the conditions, um, of, uh, at least for a longer period of time away, uh, were so good. Um, in Holland in those days, um, the research money was based on the number of uh, first-year dental students. So we, we never had to, uh, to ask for grants or something like that. So it was f really free, independent research. And when you became professor, then you, all, then you also got two full-time positions for PhD students. So 
Holland was extremely rich, and I think in those days we spent an enormous amount of our budget on education. And I think percentage-wise it is now um, less. And what and nowadays um, you have to ask for grants, and I think because of the past we are not so good in writing grants, we have not really used it, at least not in, in the dental field. So that and dentistry is still not regarded uh, as a very important disease. So you have to uh, uh, compete with uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer disease, and they're all going. So it is not easy to get money. So in those days, and then in the US, it was the same. It was uh, all grant, grant money for research. And, uh, and here we had uh, free money for research. And that, uh, that made it easy to do what you would like to do. And that's also, nowadays, um, a lot of research is done because of the research. In those days, uh, it was because someone had an idea and he, wa he wanted to, to, to look himself how it worked out. And especially for people who are also clinicians, that was a well, very beautiful times. If I would, would be young, uh, just qualified, uh, just finalized my uh, postgraduate studies in periodontology, and what I would like to do for future research, well, I think that would be uh, to investigate the possibility to grow teeth. I think that the, uh, of course, there's in London a group working on it already for a long time. In Japan there's a group working. They showed in animals that it is possible. And I love teeth much more than implants. So I think if we would be able to grow teeth, that would be very helpful in patient treatment.